Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is Bitcoin chart on the Huobi exchange. You can see that it went dark on the 22nd of January. That's when China decided to stop allowing margin trading. I'm not really sure why the exchange had to go dark. You can see here that Bitcoin Wisdom has replaced Huobi now with OKCoin. OK um, not nearly the volume and you can see even here uh, going back to around that same time volume drops off dramatically uh, the other one that we have there's there's some others out of China here's uh, BTC China but you can see also a significant decrease in volume so how much of the volume that we've seen out of China recently has been margin related? Uh, it's hard to say, but the price hasn't really responded that much. If, if one's going to contend that the explosive moves in Bitcoin prices since about July, which is basically a doubling, um, and then getting cut in half again from there, but uh, if, if one's going to explain that movement, it, it wouldn't be just from margin buying. Uh, if that were the case, that margin buying was what caused this run up, we'd have a much larger correction than this. And you can see that the correction has brought us down, but we're still hovering at fairly high prices. So I think that although a lot of people would argue that Bitcoin prices have been sustained, stained with borrowed money. I don't think that's the case. I think that most of the money that has gone into Bitcoin has been cash. And I think the price reflects that. So I'm, I'm going to stick by my prediction that we're going to get a rally into new highs in the price of Bitcoin. That's what this chart's telling me. We'll see though. Now let's jump over to the net dania chart here i drew in a chart this is the euro swiss franc cross and the reason why i drew this chart in if you remember back in i think it was mid 2011 it may have been 2012 but right about in here this time frame is when the swiss central bank decided to peg the franc to the euro and you can see the dramatic move that was happening in the Swiss franc and this again this is euro Swiss franc so as the price of the chart goes down that means the first one listed is, is losing value so the euro was losing value against the Swiss franc now the reason why is because Europe was having a major crisis with Greece and with some other countries and they were ECB was printing up a whole bunch of money so people were looking to exchange their euros for something that they thought would be more stable and of course that was Swiss francs so that's what caused this tremendous price move in the value of the euro versus the Swiss franc now ever since this day when they decided to use uh, forex reserves and central bank monies to pe keep them pegged you can see what's happened we've had two violent price moves the first one when this thing was instituted and then later on a few years later you can see this violent price move from about 1.2 all the way down to 0.85 then it bounced about halfway up and uh, now is kind of rolling over it appears so the main takeaway I want you to see from this is that although the government intervened in the free market to prevent people voting with their currency, you can see that when we look at this trend line here, this blue line, it really didn't make any difference. It, yes, it did slow the accelerated rate at which it was declining. But then you can see as it crossed over, there was just another violent uh, drop that basically brought it back to exactly the trend it was going to. So does government intervention in markets ultimately work? I think the answer is no. Ultimately, markets are going to move in the direction they're going to move. 
And if the government gets in the way, then this is exactly what happens. You get things stuck for a while until, until there's an extremely violent move. What does that do for investors? Well, it makes the environment much worse for investors. It's much better to have a steady, slow decline than to have violent outs outbursts that take out all the stops and wipe you out completely. So once again, government intervention in markets doesn't help. It just makes things worse. Now, speaking of government, we're going to spend the rest of the time this evening on this national debt clock. Now, the big issue is starting to come up. We know that in the spring, I think it's April 15th, the suspended debt ceiling is going to go away. So the, the situation we're in right now is that traditionally they had debt ceilings where they would have to vote to raise them and then as the debt approached that there'd be a crisis, they'd have to have another vote, they'd have to set the debt ceiling at another number and that just was going on year in and year out. Now under Obama, the last time they had the crisis, they did something different. What they did was that they decided to suspend the debt limit. So there wasn't a limit. It could just rise as high as it needed to until a certain date. And that date is April 15th this year. At that point in time, my understanding is the, the debt is just going to be, the limit is just going to be wherever it's at. And it's not going to be allowed to rise higher than that. Now we know how that's held in the past, it, it never has. But there's at least going to be a political crisis because they're going to have to come up with some other solution. And of course, we've got Republicans in both houses, uh, the Senate and the House, and we've got a Republican president. So they're going to have to deal with this issue. I think the Democrats are probably going to hold their feet to the fire, even though the Democrats didn't do anything for eight years. But... I just want to go and point out a couple of things here on the national debt clock. You can see we're getting here near 20 trillion in national debt. So Obama almost doubled it. It came really close, but not quite. Now let's just talk about some things that really jump out at us here. The first one is this, this number right here, debt per citizen, debt per taxpayer. Now the fact that you have $61,000 in debt per citizen, but you have $166,000 per taxpayer, that ought to tell you something right there. That's telling you that for every three uh, citizens that you have here, uh, you have one paying taxes. It, it's, uh, it's very bad. And you can see the situation, how bad it is here, uh, the total receiving benefits. Look at the number of those who are receiving some sort of government benefits. We've got 163 million out of a U.S. population of at 324 million. Now, if you remember the last time I visited this number, it was less than 50%. You can see now that if you double this number, you get 126, uh, I'm sorry, 326. So we are above 50% now of the total receiving benefits. That We're going in the wrong direction. Now if you look at the number of taxpayers that we have, it's 119 million, but let's subtract out government employees because their taxes that they pay come from someone else's taxes. So we take those away and you can see that puts us down below 100 million people who are paying taxes to support this population of 324. So very similar to these numbers that we're seeing in debt per citizen. Now we've already covered the dollar to silver ratio, dollar to gold ratio, that just goes back to 1913. But here's one that jumped out at me as well that seems to be very, very interesting here. Now you remember in 2008, the major precursor to that financial crisis was the topping of the housing market and the rolling over of housing prices, which caused uh, a knock-on effect on the mortgage-backed paper market. And ultimately, we had cascading defaults, which nearly completely collapsed the system. 
So we had a massive housing bubble, and the question is, are we building another massive housing bubble? Well, I think looking at these numbers, you can probably argue that we are. So you can see here, let's compare these medium income figures to medium new home prices. You can see medium income in 2000 was 28,897. Now median is the median, the way you figure out a median average is you count from the lowest to the highest and you just pick the middle number as opposed to a mean, which is an average. But the median is probably not that far off from the mean. It's probably a decent number to use. And what's so shocking here is you can see that from 2000, and it's now 2017, so 17 years later, uh, for all intents and purposes, this number is 29,000. So 17, it's taken 17 years to have exactly $1,000 onto the median income. Now, look over at the housing prices. Back when we had that $29,000 median income in 2000, we had a median house price, a median new home price of 161000 Now that's risen up $1,000, really just you know a very, very small percentage. What is that, 3%, 4%? But look at this, the price of a new home has nearly doubled. So how do we have new home prices being almost double what they were in 2000, but the median income only up about 3%, only up about $1,000. Well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out to tell you it must be debt. There is debt in the system, and that's what's blowing this up. Now, there's an article right now on Zero Hedge about Blackstone and how the government has been using Fannie and Freddie to backstop their portfolio of rental houses. What they've done is I don't know if you notice in your neighborhood, but I've noticed in my neighborhood that uh, the number of available foreclosures has really dried up. So some of these groups like Blackstone and others have gone out and bought up portfolios of these uh, foreclosed properties, uh, turned them into rental properties, etc. And now they're writing mortgage-backed securities again on these converted rent-to-own type of properties. So we're repeating the exact mistake that we made the last time. We're blowing up a gigantic real estate bubble again using debt. I don't see how, if you can see something I'm not seeing here, I don't see how you can conclude from these numbers, with the median income only going up $1,000, but the new home price is nearly doubling. I don't see how uh, there could be any other explanation for that except that's just a massive increase in the debt. Uh, I just don't see any other way. So again, we were actually in a worse crisis than probably before we entered into the financial crisis last time. This time we've got a massive housing bubble. We've doubled the national debt. The number of taxpayers is decreasing. We've got baby boomers retiring at a phenomenal pace now. It, it's really accelerating. We can see that now the number of those receiving benefits is more than 50% of the U.S. population. So this thing is starting to accelerate. It's going to be very difficult for Donald Trump to turn this thing around. Uh, I really don't see an easy way out of this, but it's going to be very interesting moving forward, and we'll talk to you next time.